Hello everyone and welcome back to another Pony Wolf Productions video. My name is Visual Pony and today we are reading the story Heart is Where the Home Is by Skyrider. And I will say just this right now. First, there's an amazing list of the amazing people keeping this channel alive and of course keep me alive as well because you know food is kind of a thing that I need to live. And there are bills to be paid. Yeah, actually. Anyway, there's also a big red button under this. If it is still red, then that means that you have not yet subscribed to Pony and Wolf Productions. And the little bell next to it lets you set it to all notifications. Then you see when we do a community post or release a new video. However, the last thing that I kind of want to say here. Oh my god, guys, it's so hot in here. It's so hot in here. Today is supposedly one of the hottest days in the year. We are expecting 43 degrees Celsius. And uh, right now I'm sitting in my car, I have the AC off, and oh my word, I'm sweating so hard that it's literally running down my back into my butt crack. So I'll get into the meat of the story and not even go with my usually I'm annoying you spiel. I didn't expect to find myself back here at the wreck so soon. Then again, I didn't expect a lot of things that happened today. Weathering the assault of a giant, bellowing creature who towered over the rooftops of Ponyville, annihilating everything in his path remains high on the list. I've never been a grieving sort of mare. The world has closed any number of doors on my past, and I know, both in my heart and my brain, that the only solution that ever works is to not give up, to build again, to laugh in the face of a sometimes cruel world. To never let them see that falter. I'll get there. I will. The certain sure knowledge that there are bigger and better things waiting for me just over the horizon is its own sort of comfort too. I know that I'm a mare of destiny, marked for great things. Maybe in the eyes of the universe it simply was not right for me to occupy such a humble home. Maybe the universe is slowly trying to mold me into the mare I am meant to be. As a famous sculptor once said, chipping away every part of me that is not great. My home was small and cozy and safe, but in the end, not exactly grand. Perhaps, in the larger scheme of things, it had to go. An inevitability, sure as water flowing downhill. Sometimes it is beyond the power of one little pony to fight a current that strong. I tell myself a lot of things to make myself feel better. It doesn't make the hurt go away. So here I am, standing before a mess of splintered and sundered wood. I shouldn't even be awake at this hour, but I don't exactly know how the public works division operates in this town. Efficient, I'll bet. It'll probably be cleared away soon like the worthless ruin that it is. And this is why I woke and made my way back here tonight. By tomorrow it might be gone, and I couldn't stand the thought of leaving it forever without one last goodbye. For years this pile of rubble was my castle, my sanctum, my home. A warm retreat to hunker down in on a cold winter's night, and in the heat of summer, a bright open space in which to practice my craft. Whenever despair hobbled my steps, this was a place I would return to, to see comfort in memories of obstacles surpassed and triumphs achieved. It was the first home I ever really had and, other than the cloth on my back, it literally housed every object that I ever called my own. I know what you're thinking. You're just like the rest of them, aren't you? Every pony will tell you that they're just sinks. Sinks can be replaced, ponies can't. It's one of those aggravatingly reflexive pleasantries that ponies will always offer when this sort of tragedy strikes some pony else, not themselves. Do you have a photo album? Of course you do. Why not just rip it up? Put something with a little functional utility in its place. It's just sinks, right? In your heart, you know it isn't true. Experience and memories transform simple trinkets into artifacts and totems. They're not just mementos. 
There are the moorings to which our memories are hitched so that they do not float away and become nothing more than lost floatsome on the foggy ocean of time. Costumes, books, a single dried rose. These aren't just globs of cotton and silk and wood pulp and decaying vegetable matter. In a very real, albeit metaphysical sense, they are my experiences. They are my past. They are who I am, everything that made me the great mare I am today. And now they are nothing but garbage. Fodder for a street sanitation crew. I kick listlessly with one hoof at my entire old life. So, this is it. The close of another chapter. A season ends, a season begins. Change is good, they tell me. Usually the same ponies who earlier trotted out the they're just sinks chestnut. Change is not to be feared but embraced. They grudgingly must admit that this time they do have a point. It's hard when change seems to fly in the face of everything you thought your creator intended for you, when you worry that the future looks like nothing more than a long, slow slide towards mediocrity and oblivion. But I'm better than that. I've endured worse and I will probably endure worse than this. In the end, this will be remembered as nothing more than a short, tragic setback. A tiny, illegible footnote of despair in a long, illustrious life filled with amazing accomplishments. I draw myself up to my full height, taking warmth and strength from the greatness that is to come, and turn my back on my former home for the last time. The brightest of all possible tomorrows awaits me. I just wish I had some, you know, friends or something. A couch to crash on, at least. I shake away the treacherous thoughts. Friends are for the weak. Twilight Sparkle meets friends. The great and powerful Trixie does not. I have a cloak. I have a hat. The night is not so cold. The woods are full of edible pine nuts. And the Pegasus ponies high above have promised us no rain for the entire rest of the week. It is a comfort to know that my immediate physical needs will be taken care of, so that my mind will be free to think about the important things. A new town, a new act, a new wagon. Revenge. It's good to have a plan. And it's good to have a refreshed perspective on life. The show must go on, even if for no other reason that you have to give the bits back otherwise. Still and all, I really do hate giant monsters. Stupid Ursa Minor, I mutter to myself. I wheel about and gallop off towards the future. Hello everyone and welcome back to Common Time Social Pony, where I remind you that you can support Pony and Wolf Productions through the links down in the description below. Every dollar helps is needed and very much appreciated and it helps to keep the lights on around here and also to keep me eating and this channel alive. Because, you know, um... I I am very confident in Midnight, I really am, but I think that if she had to manage this channel alone, you know, you wouldn't get nearly as many updates. Um, anyhow, <clears throat> guys, let's be real here. You have to like and subscribe if you thought that this was a Twilight story. Because I sure did. I thought that this was Twilight returning to the Golden Oaks Library. And only when this whole thing with who needs friends, friends are for the week came up, I was like, wait, who are we talking about here? And then I was like, oh, great, it's the great and powerful Trixie. Yeah, you must like and subscribe if you did not see that coming. Sincerely yours, Visual Pony, and I hope that this video finds you well in body and mind, and that I will not melt in this frickin' heat. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Pony and Wolf Productions video. My name is as always Visual Pony and today we are reading the story Hearthwarming Cookies by the author Everyday. He has Angel Bunny as a as an avatar. Oh my god, Angel Bunny. Oh god, Angel Bunny. Uh I don't I don't much like Angel Bunny, but anyhow, here's a list of those amazing people who keeps this channel alive and me eating. Which, you know, kinda is needed to also keep me alive. 
Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Also, I will, as always, remind you that if the button under this video is still red, that means that you have not donated to Pony and Wolf Productions, and that means you will not be notified about our upcoming releases. Come on, guys. You want to be notified, don't you? Anyhow, let's get into this, because I am fairly certain that I am annoying you right now, aren't I? The little filly watched with curious eyes as her father levitated a plate of cookies and a glass of milk, carrying them to the nightstand beneath the window. Why do we leave cookies out every half of an eve? She asked. Because it's tradition, her father answered as he set them down. But why is it tradition? She pressed with an exaggerated tilt of her head. He looked from the cookies to the window, watching the snow fall through the moonlight as he considered his answer. That's just how it's always been. Celestia and Luna loved housewarming. They loved the snowy evenings that inspired ponies to snuggle together in front of a fireplace. They loved the decorations that brightened the streets as much as they did pony spirits. They loved the carols that seemed to transcend time and bring together entire generations. And of course, they loved the sense of goodwill that filled the hearts of every pony this time of year. But what they loved most of all was the hearth-warming cookies. The sweet smell of cinnamon wafting through the halls was the true herald of the season. Every year, on the night of hearth-warming eve, Celestia would prepare a batch of cookies just for Luna. She patiently waited for the cookies she was baking to finish, basking in the warmth that radiated from the oven. At her insistence, most of the staff had left early to spend heartwarming eve with their loved ones, leaving Celestia to bake in peace. Celestia carefully levitated the tray of cookies out of the oven and onto the counter. The air filled with a familiar scent, making her nose tingle, but Luna liked her cookies with extra cinnamon. As the cookies began cooling, Celestia began gathering the icing to decorate them. Each cookie would depict a star or a feather or a tree, in honor of the three tribes and their unification. As she was about to decorate the last cookie, an idea occurred to her that brought a smile to her face. She moved the icing across the cookie with the meticulous precision an artist would give a painting. Once finished, this cookie featured a crescent moon against an inky backdrop. Luna's Cutie Mark Celestia smiled as she imagined how Luna would react to seeing that one. After carefully hiding it amongst the other cookies, Celestia prepared a cup of cold milk and set everything on a serving tray. She levitated the tray and began to walk to Luna's bedroom. The click of her hoofs echoed through the halls decorated with streamers and tinsel and wreath. The whole interior seemed to glow with its own light. Celestia occupied herself by picturing the way Luna would light up when she saw the hearth-warming cookies. The way she would bend the soft cookie against her teeth instead of biting through it. The way she would lick her lip after drinking the milk. And the way she would rub her neck against Celestia's in thanks. Celestia found herself outside of Luna's chambers before she even realized it. A golden light enveloped the doors and gently pushed them open. The room was empty, as expected. Celestia stepped towards the balcony with the cookies and milk in tow. Through the window, she could see snow falling in the night air, made brilliant by the lights of hearth-warming decorations. She closed her eyes and lowered the platter onto the floor, bathing the cookies and the moonlight filtering through the balcony window. The scent of cinnamon permeated the room and filled her lungs. Celestia had long outgrown making half-warming wishes and praying for miracles. Yet, there she was, head lowered, hoping with all of her might that she might next open her eyes, her greatest desire would be granted. She finally opened her eyes and, with great difficulty, lifted her head to look at the moon. A compulsion to stay tugged at her heart, but she turned herself away and went back to the doors. Her step faltered before she could pass through the threshold, and she drew a shaky breath as she turned to the moon. Happy hearthwarming eve, Luna, she whispered. The halls seemed less bright than they had before as she made her way to her own room, deciding to retire for the evening. 
She collapsed onto her bed and curled into her sheets as she steadied her breathing. Memories of Luna smiling and laughing washed over her like a flood. The first time Celestia had noticed that Luna was not as cheerful as she usually was during the heartwarming season, so she decided to surprise her with cookies she made herself. Luna's eyes lit up like the stars when she saw the cookies. She hesitated for a moment, having nothing to offer her. Celestia assured her that no gift could compare to seeing her dear sister smile again. The smile she gave Celestia that year remained the most captivating she had ever seen. And so it was that each year, Celestia would bring Luna a batch of heartwarming cookies with milk, and she would ask for nothing more than a smile in return. The very last time, Celestia found Luna on her balcony, looking over the sleeping city below. So many ponies were dreaming of the heartwarming celebrations that would come in the morning. It seemed to them that the night could not end soon enough. Unsure of what to say, Celestia offered her a cookie and reminded her how much she loves her. The smile she gave Celestia that year remained the most melancholy she had ever seen. The memories began to fade as Celestia drifted off to sleep, still chiding herself for behaving like a naive little foal. Even so, she clung to the hope that her wish might come true when the next morning came. All she wanted for heartwarming was to find that the cookies had been eaten. Hello and welcome back to Common Time with Visual Pony, where I remind you that you can support Pony and Wolf Productions through the links down in the description below, and that every dollar helps is needed and very much appreciated in keeping the lights on around here and to actually keep me alive. Why I'm not talking as quickly right now is I am crying. I'm crying, guys. This story made me cry from the moment that I realized, oh my words, this is a story written during the time of Luna's banishment. You know, there's always this... I know how it's different canonically, like if we look at the show, but for me it will always be something like in the video um, Lullaby for a Princess, if you've ever looked at the animation, where... Celestia is actually fighting back against Luna, where Celestia is fighting Nightmare Moon. And then in the end, it's basically a, it, that Celestia is not consciously, you know, using the elements. Um, I, I, I like this, I like this idea better. Um, I, if I remember correctly, in the, in the show, I would have to rewatch it, but I think in the show, it is canonical that Celestia actually wants to use the elements on Luna. In the animation, in the fan animation, it is like she gets knocked through a window, she hits the el the altar of the of the elements of harmony, and then the element of magic falls next to her and the nightmare moon comes through the window and attacks her and she just out of a you know pure survival situation moment just grabs the elements and uses them, you know? And then when she sees that she just banished Luna, she's just totally distraught. She's crying. She's screaming. And, um, see, that is what I think for me. For me, this is canon, okay? For me, that is more canon than what I saw in the show because this is more realistic because I personally, I, I'm not a big Celestia fan. Anyone who knows me, no, knows that I'm a fan of Luna more than of, than of Celestia, but I personally think if Luna had endangered other ponies and everything, I don't think that Celestia would have stood by and just evaded attacks like she did in the in the show. I think she would have fought Luna all out, and um, then in a snap decision or survival type kind of deal, you know, like in that fan animation, she would have just grabbed the elements and hoped that they fix everything, but in the end banished Luna to the moon and then had to live with that decision for a thousand years, you know? So, I like the story. It made me cry. It's it's certainly going into my favorites. It's not just going into my read later. This one is going into my favorites because I like it. And, uh, yeah, let me know in the comments down below what you think, because this has been one of my longer comment times so far for a while and, oh my word, I hope that this story, as always, finds you well in body and mind.
Hello everypony and welcome back to another Pony and Wolf Productions video. My name is as always Visual Pony and today we are reading the story Moonstone by the author Jikintura. I really hope that I pronounced that correctly, but you will see his name on screen as always. And of course in the title of this video because I think credit where credit is due. And this is a good good segue to give credit to those amazing people who support this channel with their monthly donations and keep it alive that way. Well, even if just barely, but you know, it keeps me eating and I kind of need food. Um, especially since, yeah, it's a time of recording this. I am, um, no, let's, let's, you know, let's get real for a second, guys. I, it's a time of recording this. I'm literally in a lot of financial trouble. Um, anyhow. Uh, as always, I will also remind you that there is a big red button under this video, and if it is still red for you, then you have not yet subscribed to us. And yeah, let's get into this. A parcel of Feldspar. The day had come. Luna strode forward with purpose through the castle, and her hoofs clicked with urgency against the marble floor. Her destination was a place sequestered in the heart of the castle, where no pony other than she or her sister may enter. Luna pondered. What is a gift if not a sort of another individual given life? Some pony like Luna was never satisfied with mundane things such as cards or small tokens of affection. Nay, Luna embodied an Alicorn princess, divine of the night, and she would never stoop to delivering a simple trinket as evidence of her favor. She stopped at a pair of stone doors marked with the sun and moon. The forge of the royal sisters was where she and her sister once toiled to bring peace to Equestria. With a touch of her magic, the doors ground open and she slipped inside into the cold darkness of a furnace that had laid dead for centuries. With a deep breath, Luna drew upon the power of the moon and stars before stamping her hoof, channeling her power of her birthright into the surface. In an instant, the darkness roared into light, the kiln transforming from frozen stone to violent inferno. Luna let herself grin with satisfaction before returning to her task. Hammer and steel, brute instruments used to fashion weapons of war turned to another task. A battle more subtle, yet full of its own terrors. Fires glared from the forge as Luna worked, her coat laced from heat and strain as she cut into a stone she excavated herself from the roots of the earth. For those ponies of the earth do toil their soils, it is they who cleave gems from stone, metal from ore. With the might of the races of earth, Luna struck the stone with her bare hoofs, mining it for the materials she desired. With a flick, she sent her chosen hunks of ore tumbling into a vat which hissed and spat angrily, quickly dissolving the metals within. Luna watched closely, but never once channeled her magic, for this was the domain of Earth, and she dare not trespass. The alchemical solution, naturally heated by the fires of the forge, bubbled and hissed, slowly changing from clear to a dark purple. With practice timing, Luna tipped in another alchemical cocktail, and the mixture frothed, the surface turning a silvery hue. With a tip, she drained the solution away, and at the bottom sat a small lump of pure platinum. Luna allowed herself a small content smile, touching the platinum with her hoof and feeling it to be true. The metal that was the sun and moon, the unadulterated ore of twilight. Carefully she lifted the precious metal and placed it within the crucible of the forge. The alicorn aspect of Earth had been fulfilled. She turned and touched her magic, molten wax springing to life in streams and weaving into intricate patterns never before realized. She channeled the pool of arcane energy within herself. The shifting form of her soul. She poured it into the sculpture she lovingly rendered. The ponies of magic shape the world to their vision. It is they who enact their will upon the world to form it in a way they see fit. Luna shut her eyes and thrust into existence what sang in her heart. With a blast of ice-cold wind, she froze the form in place, 
and with another flick of her horn she wrapped the intricate work in layers of plaster, hardening each one with a pulse of magic. She lifted the plaster mold into the furnace and watched as the wax slowly melted away, leaving a hollow shell. She set down the mold with satisfaction, with in her heart's design permanently written. The alicorn aspect of magic was satisfied. She looked down in the crucible, the palpable heat slapping against her as she stood near the heart of the furnace. A mere mortal would be turned to ash in seconds, but Luna was no mortal. Without hesitation, she threw open the furnace and stepped up to the crucible. Ponies of the air were the closest to the wild, rapid heartbeat of life. Their ancestors stood as fierce warriors who gave no quarter, honorable but vicious to the very last. For every drop of blood they lost, they would take back tenfold. But blood given willingly held a sacred meaning between Pegasi, a pact beyond the water of the womb. No sword could stay sharp in such heat, so Luna instead pulled from her magic a blade of unbreakable starlight. Without hesitation, she drew it across her foreleg, drawing the silvery ichor that was her blood and watching as it fell into the crucible, mixing with the molten metal within. The Pegasus warrior spirit within her watched in grim satisfaction the sacrifice of her lifeblood and grew content. With each of her aspects fulfilled, Luna stepped out of the furnace with the crucible in hoof. Carefully, she put the molten metal into her mold. With her magic, she tapped on the plaster to force out the bubbles and waited anxiously for her finished product. It would not do to have something go wrong at this final, critical stage. After the metal cooled, Luna set about carefully chipping away the plaster mold from her work. She fussed over the small nooks and delicate joints using a small scrubber to clean the metal and make it shine. The platinum gleamed a brilliant silvery white, glowing softly from Luna's offering of divine blood. With a small smile of relief joy, Luna carefully lifted the brooch and placed within its mounting a hoof-cut, polished moonstone. And so came the most harrowing part of all, the giving of the gift. While Luna had been lazard from exertion as she had worked on her precious piece of jewelry, she now found herself sweating for an entirely different reason as she stood in front of the door of whom she loved more than any pony else in the world. Her nerves jumped, mind rife with uncertainty as she knocked, and the approaching hoofsteps felt spaced by eternity. As the door creaked open, she shakily held forward her gift. A different battle being fought in a different kind of war. Happy birthday, my love! Author's Note With this, I foray into a strange new world where symbols are fractured into words and stamped into sentences. I invite you, reader, to join me as I explore this difficult new terrain. Thank you for reading. I hope you return for the next I bring. Who Luna loves is left nebulous on purpose, but those who know me well could probably guess who I had in mind. Hello and welcome back to Common Thomas vs. Pony, where I remind you that you can support Pony with both productions through the links down in the description below. Every dollar helps is needed and very much appreciated and helps to keep the lights on around here. And you want to keep the lights on around here, right, 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 right? Because, you know, without the lights I don't have electricity, I can't have my fridge on, and I can't, you know, store food, and I actually can't buy food without money. Actually, and also you get awesome, awesome perks as a patron. As a patron on Patreon, you know, like, for example, early access downloads of the MP3 files of these stories. Anyhow, what do I have to say about this? Well, the author doesn't explicitly say who Luna is planning to, uh, to give that uh, brooch to, but come on. It's the um, platinum, the metal that uh, is the twilight metal, as she herself calls it, you know, the metal that is sun and moon. So who else could it be? And personally, I can see that, I can see that I kind of like the twilight Luna ship, the twiluna ship. I really do. So, good work there. 
Jinkitura. Since, since uh, there's nothing more that I can say here, it's an amazing story. I love it. Let me know your opinion in the comments down below. And as always, I hope that this story finds you well in body and mind. Hello everyone, and again, welcome back to another Pony and Wolf Productions video. My name is Wizard Pony, and today we are reading the story Princess Luna Likes Coffee by the author Bradel. Huh, okay, the story was written in 2013, in the year that I joined the Brony community and became a YouTube pony creator. Oh my word, it's been nine years by the time of this recording, and... Oh my word, actually, it is the 12th of July 2022 today. And as always, at this point, I will show you a list of those amazing people who keep this channel alive and keep me eating, you know? Keep me alive as well, not just the channel. Me. Please. I want to live. I don't want to die. Ah! Anyhow, um... <laughs> I will also remind you that there's a big button under this video, and if it is not white for you or grayed out, then that means that it is still red and you have not yet subscribed to Pony and Wolf Productions. And now I will get into the meat of the story, because I am very certain that I am annoying you to no end right now. It's so lonely on the moon. All things considered, spending a thousand years on the moon isn't so bad. Oh no, do not mistake us. Being there is awful. The dust gets in thy mane, and thou canst never find a comfortable place to sit. We do not know if thou be familiar with the scent of a blacksmith's shop, when the forge's fires burned hot and the metal lies golden against the anvil. But the scent of the moon is much like that. And never does it change. The days... For yes, even on the moon there are days and nights. The days are like an inferno, and the nights are the heart of deep winter. But without the snow, that always made us sad. There's only dust. Miles and miles of dust. But the worst of it, the absolute worst, is when dear sister plucks thee from the void each night and thrusts thee into the heavens. Or perhaps when she sends thee back during the day. They're much the same, and believe us, it doesn't matter what thou grabst hold of. Thou wilt go tumbling across the surface quite fiercely. The only comfort is that no pony is present to see the undignified way thou bouncest over rocks and craters. Nor will they see the havoc this wrecks on thy coat and mane. Did we mention the dust? But when thou art eternal, what's a thousand years here or there? And anyway, being trapped in the form of a world-ending monstrosity helps cushion the hurt a little. Thou canst hardly fault thy sister for treating thee interparentally when thou didst try to bring about eternal night. But we are drifting far afield. We wish to tell thee why it's not so bad spending a millennium in the moon's cold embrace. Being there is awful, but coming back? Coming back is wondrous and wondrously strange. Dear sister has always loved her tea, and never mind that story Twilight wrote to the contrary. She prefers a hearty brew of jasmine, though she has her dirty little secret. When it's just the two of us, she adds lemon and honey. It is completely improper. We don't think even Twilight knows this yet, though she can hardly help but learn, now that she's a princess too. It's been months since we had a proper tea, in the old fashion, but dear sister has one planned for the equinox, as always. We used to do it four times a year before... Well, before our unfortunate relocation. It seems she kept the tradition even in our absence, and when Cadence was made an alicorn, dear sister began to invite her as well. She must have grown terribly lonely after all that time. No, it is nothing. Just... just a spot of dust in our eye. Where were we? Oh, yes, dear sister and her tea. Well, no amount of lemon, nor honey, nor any other contrivance has ever served to make the stuff palatable to us. We enjoy dear sister's company, so we have long endured this in silence. It is a small thing, but in the thousand years we were gone... Coffee! 
Now there is a wondrous thing indeed. What pony would think to take berry seeds, roast them, grind them up and steep them in boiling water? We have consulted the histories on this point, but they are sadly silent. We had briefly entertained the hopes that we might be able to set up some sort of monument to his or her artifice. And this coffee is so much better than tea! The aroma tantalizes one's taste buds, and the excellent bitterness of the brew is such a welcome change from that icky jasmine taste. Dear sister apprehended our liking to this beverage very quickly and was entirely understanding when we suggested that perhaps it could be served at our equonical and solistical gatherings. This is precisely why we say that being gone for a thousand years isn't such a bad thing. The surprises that greet thee upon thy return are truly magnificent. And coffee isn't the only thing. Dost thou know about donuts? Like little round cakes, fried cakes, with sprinkles. And we hardly need to tell thee about Nightmare Night. Colts and fillies coming out in costume all to celebrate the night. It is... Oh, Tia, I'm so sorry. No, please, it's fine. We are happy now. Isn't that what we were just saying? There are so many wonderful new things in this world. Like trains and the heartwarming pageant. And fiction! Yes, we think that may be our favorite. Well, no, our second favorite. Back in the old days, ponies didn't have nearly as much time for things like art or riding. Dear sister tells us that this fiction thing is nearly a thousand years old now. And yes, it was stirring even before our departure. Hoofocults and Eurhippides were both writing plays for actors to perform, back in the pre-classical era. But now there are so many books, so many stories like fresh little worlds we can jump into. This is not how it was when we left. And Twilight Sparkle has a very deft hoof with this fiction. She has written a number of stories now, though she usually hides them under other ponies' names. We think she's afraid dear sister will find out about some of them. Of course, dear sister knows all about those stories. She's the one who told us after all. But it's perhaps best that Twilight doesn't know she knows. We suspect that Twilight would be extraordinarily embarrassed were some of those stories to come to light. Twilight is very good at astronomy too. This is an unadulterated joy to us, to be able to share our love of the night with some pony so talented and wonderful. We often like to invite Twilight to join us at the Cantalot Observatory when particularly unusual little events are ahoof in our night sky. What? Oh no, we only control the moon. The stars and the planets and the comets, those all move on their own accord. They are... how to explain it? Dost thou know of the Everfree Forest near Ponyville? Twilight has told us of it two or three times. It is part of Equestria and yet the seasons have a will of their own there. The animals take care of themselves. The night sky is much like that. We have control of the moon and over certain other small parts of it, but much of the sky is as unknown to us as it is to any pony. Even after all these years, we are discovering new and exciting things each week. Twilight has identified no less than six new nebulae and three galaxies. And she has ideas about how we can build a new telescope that can... <laughs> we are rambling again, aren't we? Our apologies. But thou must understand that of all the things in this new world, there's one which holds our favor most of all. Twilight Sparkle. She is our very favorite thing. And we have dear sister to thank for her. What a wondrous discovery she made in Twilight. We wish we could have been there, to see her as a filly, earning her cutie mark. But that was not to be. That was our own fault. We must not dwell on past sins over much. It is unseemly. And it is unnecessary. She is our friend now, and that is all that matters. Nothing could be better than that. Well, perhaps there is one thing. I have a new sister. Hello and welcome back to Common Time with Visual Pony, where I remind you that you can support Pony Wolf Productions through the links down in the description below. Every dollar helps as needed and very much appreciated and helps to keep the lights on around here and helps me to keep eating. Anyhow, um, let's get into the meat of the story because I don't think I can keep going like this. Um, what can I say, guys? This is an interesting story, like, uh, from Luna's perspective to see, you know, what is different, what she thinks is cool and all that. 
So I have a feeling that she sees Twilight's uh, Twilight as more than just a new sister, if you get my drift. Um, I'm fairly certain there is more a hoof here. Sincerely yours, Virgil Pony, and let me know what you think about this. As always, I hope that this story finds you well in body and mind. Hello and welcome back to another Pony and Dwarf Productions video. My name, as always, is Virgil Pony, and today we are reading The Age of Iron by an author that we have featured on this channel many a times. Overlord Flinks. Yes, the Overlord is back. And... And as always, I will now show you a list of those amazing people who keep the channel alive with their monthly donations and keep me able to eat. Anyhow, I will also remind you that under this video there's a button which you can press to subscribe to the channel and a little bell that will notify you about all of our newest releases. And don't forget, in the description down below there are also other links, like the link to the story and, don't forget, there's also a link to our merch store. Yes, guys, we have merch. So, now, without further ado, and I know that I'm annoying, let's get into the meat of the story. My papa told me years ago, Mare and Stallion alike will always fight for supremacy. Supremacy, I learned, was not as black and white as my papa once had tried to teach me. Supremacy is to the victor, no? Supremacy of power of pleasure, of right and might. It is a decoration that those with potential wear as they stand above the streets. Supremacy melted down is a fine, glittering gold. Gold that singes the hoof tips as you dip them into its velvet-like embrace. Much like the supremacy it is so richly mirrors. My mama told me when I was young, Those without horns are no better than serfs. Those without wings from the serfs are as good as dirt. Dirt is to be spit on. At least that is what those that loom above the dirt believe with their pompous arrogance. Mama was right with her words, sadly. We do not have to accept this, though. The unicorns and pegasi? They are fearful creatures. They hide within their shrouds made of clouds or magic. While us below? We hide within the dirt within the earth. The earth that hides many great powers within. My grandpa shared with me his wisdom once. The sea, the winds and even the heavens share one mighty trait. They fight a mighty battle against the earth from sunrise to the end of time. Do you not understand? The sea beats against the land, but does it kneel? The winds slice against the face of the world, but does it cry? The heavens pelt against the stone with hail and rain. But does it beg? No. The earth never gives in to defeat. Why? Because it is not supremacy's gilded gold. No. It is humility's unbending silver. Firm, strong, and proud. Something those with supremacy cannot hope to understand. My name is Silver Bit. I live within the proud Crystal Empire among the beaten and weathered earth ponies within these harsh times. Much like the fires, we must stoke ourselves daily, so as to prevent the heel of oppression from crushing our worn bodies. But it strengthens our resolve. Not all of our resolves, if any, but mine will never break. It will never bend. It will never give. My resolve is mighty. Like my forge. Yes, the forge. The forge is of my own design. I brought it into this world under the visions I suffered from above. Onto me, the makers imparted visions of hope. The visions of a whole world based in Earth's ever-giving life. A world not made of stone or of wood or even of mud, but a world made of the Earth's most powerful and strongest craft. Stones, unlike any pony had ever seen. They are not dull or rigid. These stones are beautiful in color and smooth to the touch. They are stronger than gold and even silver. This is metal. Metal. Earth's greatest gift to ponykind. Pure, raw metal. 
Something those with supremacy cannot come close to mastering. Why? Because it comes from the dirt. From the earths. From metal. Metal breeds metal, and metal bolsters metal. Or so I have dreamed. In truth, the forge has not been used to make anything of great use as of yet. In fact, it has only been used once, at the cost of my front hoofs. I broke down earth itself with my mallet for hours. Sweat dripped from upon my brow and salted against my tired eyes as the hours drove on. But, in time, the earth yielded to me its secrets. Not gold or silver, but something new. Something weak, shifting and chalky at my first touch. I named it tin and copper. With these two I worked them together, melting them down into one another to form a new form of metal itself. One that I came to call bronze. I spent days forming the cast I wished to mold my first work of metal into. It was that cast which I put the first collection of bronze I had made. However, when I did that, my front hoofs were burned to a crisp. The village screamed with my wails of pain as the bronze poured into the cast which I labored over. I watched from pain-filled eyes as metal, Earth's newest and most beautiful gift, formed into something of my own design. It spent hours of cooling, weathering and testing before I finally removed my creation from the cast. That marked my first creation. I named it Welding Claw. Bronze unshakable, and made so I would never have to burn my hoofs again. It was a perfect invention. Now, when I have my own children, my own kin, I will share with them my knowledge. Mares and stallions can never be trusted, but the earth can. Ask the earth for anything and it will provide for you. Ponies are deceitful and prideful, but steel, metal? Metal you can always trust. I do not really believe that myself. But it's only a hope that words like that will inspire the next generation to make a metal world. A world made from the Earth's riches. A world that the unicorns will envy and the pegasi will seize over. A world made from the labor of the Earth ponies that will tower over all the rest. Not for the sake of pride or the need to crawl out from the gutters but to bring hope to the other races in the dirt. For now, as I stand before my forge, smock against my breast, tongs within my muzzle, and claw holding firm the red hot of a forging art, I tell you this. No one race is weak or strong. It is a power to see the deepest reaches of anything's treasures that makes us all really mighty. And that deep, 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 deep down is true supremacy, knowing how to equal out what makes us different. Or, we are all much like the ore beneath our hoofs, cold, rigid, filled with secrets and unfounded potential. The potential to create or the potential to destroy, to build or to deconstruct. To forge or to melt away. No single ore shaped the same, each one holding many different minerals and cuts to it, both flawless and damaged even at first glance. What may come of it not a pony could say for certain, no? But all the same in that each and every ore, pony, was at one point brought into the world by another's work. Everything has a start. Everything has a story, and sometimes that story is only there for the build-up for an even greater tale. Okay, and welcome back to another common time with Visual Pony, where I will remind you that you can support Pony Wolf Productions through the links down in the description below. Every dollar helps is needed and very much appreciated, and don't forget that we actually have a merch store. And now let's get into the meat of the story, because I think I'm kind of out of practice with this little fast talking. Okay, what do I think about this? Um, first, I must, uh, full disclosure here, um, this whole thing with uh, 
the or at the end that is actually a second chapter but since the second chapter is only 120 words long i decided i would put it into the same recording because you know putting out a video for just 120 words that's that's not how we do things here but i kind of wanted to cover the story because overall flinks is a very good author so the whole spiel with supremacy and everything, I have a feeling that there's a, a message in there, and I kind of have an idea what it is, but I will not say anything to that regard. You all make your own, um, your own, you, you form your own opinion, because, you know, that's why we have uh, free will and free thought. So um, you form your own opinion there. And as always, I am Visual Pony, and I hope that this video finds you well in body and mind.